I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Chris, we've missed you. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to continue what we've been doing. We've been going through the book of, I almost said Philippians, good night. I swear I'm awake, people. We've been going through Hebrews. Yeah, yeah, they're letters. <laughs> and quick recap. For what we saw in chapters 1 and 2, again, I think it's phenomenal that the first four verses of Hebrews really read like the abstract or the beginning of a scientific paper where they just give you all the information up front and then they expand on it through the rest of the letter. What we saw in chapter 1 is that Jesus is superior to the angels. He's been given a place far superior to them. He's been given the name above all names by the Father, the name of Jesus. Because at the time, there was an issue with people worshiping angels. We don't worship angels, we worship Jesus. And so in chapter 2, what the writer addressed was a thing called docetism, where they said, yeah, okay, sure, fine. Jesus was all God, but he only looked like a guy. He, wa he wasn't all man. And so the writer of Hebrews went, no, he, he was all man. Let me go ahead and lay it out for you really quick. Talks about how Jesus was humbled for a short period of time. He took the limitations of humanity on so that he could accomplish the plan that the Father had set out for him. Now, I know we're reading chapter 3, but I'm going to jump back, and we're going to go to verse 17 of chapter 2 before we start. Because it helps us to understand where we are in the logical progression of this letter. He says, Therefore... It was essential that he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers, mankind, in every respect, so that he might by experience become a merciful and faithful high priest in things related to God, to make atonement or propitiation for the people's sins, thereby wiping away sin, satisfying divine justice, and providing a way of reconciliation between God and mankind. Because he himself, in his humanity, suffered in being tempted, he is able to provide, to help and provide immediate assistance to those who are being tempted and exposed to suffering. Yes. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, because the writer isn't writing to Gentiles, isn't writing to unbelievers, he's writing to Jewish people who have converted to following Jesus and are trying to go back on it. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, thoughtfully and attentively consider the apostle and high priest whom we confessed as ours when we accepted him as Savior, namely, Jesus. And the reason that sentence is put up that way, the reason it's phrased and ordered that way, is because the emphasis point is on the last word, Jesus. He's just kind of beating them over the head with it. And it's the best thing for them, because it's the best thing for us, because I've known some people, myself is one of them, we've been known to be thick-headed now and again. Just, just maybe a little, maybe it's just me. No? Okay, good. Well, it's you and me then, Ray. <laughs> what? Did an outside force distract me? No more than usual. <laughs> Now it says he was faithful, again, Jesus, was faithful to him who appointed him apostle and high priest as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Now that is calling back to Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. Now, I don't know about y'all. I don't know a whole lot about Jewish tradition and Jewish heritage. I know what the Bible tells us, but I don't know the Old Testament nearly as well as first century Christians probably knew the Old Testament because it's what they had to preach out of. The New Testament was actively being written at that time. They hadn't put it all together nice and neat in one binding like we have. 
And so the jobs of a high priest were intimately known. It's clear that this letter was written to people who are familiar with Scripture. There are 80 references and direct references and allusions to Old Testament Scripture throughout these 13 chapters. And I would argue that half of them are in chapter 11, but we'll get there when we get to chapter 11. But the job of the high priest was to be the supreme religious leader of the nation of Israel for their lifetime. It, was, it started out with Aaron after the Exodus, and he was appointed the high priest. And for a long time, the way it worked was that when the high priest died, it went to their oldest son. It was passed down. It was a familial thing. That's why some people get all hung up on, I remember Pastor Bob told the story where someone was talking to him and he said, well, are you a part of the Aaronic priesthood? Not moronic, Aaronic, meaning he followed the line of Aaron. He went, no. Well, you can't be a priest then. Pretty sure that I can. (laughs) Doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. (laughs) But that was where that idea came from. And to be a high priest, you had to be physically whole, meaning you could not have some sort of physical defect. You couldn't have a paralysis or a chronic condition or anything like that. You had to be whole, and you had to be holy in your conduct, which was a lot more exacting in the Old Testament than it is for us in the New. They had a lot more rules to follow than we do. Now, what they did, what the high priest did, was they oversaw the responsibilities of the priests who were below them. You know, basically everyone who wasn't them is who they were in charge of in the priesthood. And so they, could over, they oversaw what they did, and they could do everything that a regular priest could do, but they had special responsibilities that the other priests didn't have. In a world of rectangles, they were a square. No one was like them, but they were like everyone else. So what they could do that was special was they would wear a thing called the Urim and the Thummim. And what they were, they were kind of like little pieces of dice that were mounted into a plate that the high priest would wear because they were the only person allowed to use them. When they got used, it was so that the people could know what the will of God was about the situation. How God spoke to them through dice, I don't know. I just know that he did. I imagine Exodus has a lot more information about it. Actually, it's Numbers 27, 21 is the specific reference for Urim and Thummim, if you feel like looking it up, but that's not necessarily tied to what we're talking about in Hebrews. Now, it's believed that they might have had the gift of prophecy based on the way that the high priest in Jesus' time acted when he prophesied unknowingly that it would be better for one man to die for the sins of all than for it to go any other way. They were in charge of sin offerings for the congregation of Israel and for themselves, according to Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3 through 21. But the most important thing they were in charge of was the thing called the Day of Atonement. Now, if you want to read the full thing, it will come up much more in chapter 9 in Hebrews, but we are weeks away from chapter 9. We are, in fact, better than a month away from chapter 9. But it's Leviticus chapter 16 that outlines the procedure for the Day of Atonement, because it was the seventh day of the tenth month in the Jewish calendar, which for us means middle-ish of October. It's called Rosh Hashanah on your calendar. It's the Jewish Day of Atonement. That is the highest of the high holy days. And what happens on the Day of Atonement is that the high priest would make a bunch of offerings. And they would make special offerings basically at every area of the temple, outside of the sanctuary, inside the sanctuary. And then there would be more sacrifices for them to go inside the Holy of Holies. The sanctuary is called the Holy Place The Holy of Holies was where God's presence was. It was called the most holy place, and it's where the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence stayed permanently while the temple was erected, at least until Jesus died. And what they would do is they would go in, and they would take the blood from an offering and sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the the Covenant, that the one on earth was just a copy of the one in heaven. Again, I'm kind of previewing what we'll talk about later. But they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, to cover the sins that everyone had made for the past year. But it didn't work forward. And the Bible tells us that 
God wasn't satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats. That's what happened. That was the big special thing that the high priest would do. And by the way, Leviticus says, that chapter in Leviticus mentions twice that if the high priest did not come correctly with all the correct preparation, he came on the wrong day, or the wrong person came on the right day, God killed them. There, there was a zero tolerance policy. Because to be in God's presence, you have to be absolutely perfect. And before Jesus, that apparently required a lot. Thankfully for us, it just requires Jesus. <laughs> Back to Hebrews chapter 3. So Moses was faithful in all of God's house at the time he was appointed, at the beginning of the law. Yet Jesus, in verse 3, has been considered worthy of much greater glory and honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Moses was considered the greatest teacher of the Old Testament. He was the one who brought the Old Covenant, the law, down from Mount Sinai on the tablets. And then he smashed them because he got mad because they acted stupid. He had to go back and get new ones. But that's in Exodus. And Moses was considered the greatest teacher of the law. Greater than any of the prophets, greater than King David, greater than King Solomon, greater than any of the judges, greater than Joshua who immediately followed him. But Jesus was in fact the best teacher of the law because Jesus was the law. And so do you, when you give glory and honor to someone, do you give more glory and honor to the person who built the house or the house that they built? The house is just a thing. It takes the person for it to exist. The law of Moses was just a thing. It took God and Jesus as the son of God for that law to exist in the first place. And these pages are thin and I flipped one too far. <laughs> now Moses was faithful in the administration of all God's house, but only as a ministering servant. His ministry is a testimony of the things which were spoken of afterward. The revelation to come in Christ. Again, that's re referred to in Numbers 12, 7. But Christ is faithful as a son over his father's house. And we are his house if we hold fast in our confidence and sense of triumph in our hope in Christ. Moses was a servant in the house of the father. And Jesus is the son of the father. There's no question who is higher on the hierarchy. The servant might know what goes on in the house, but the son is the one who can set the rules for what happens. The son is the one who's on equal authority and position with the father, not the servant. And Jesus is the son. He's in a higher, more exalted, greater position than Moses was. For someone who's coming to you and I, you go, yeah, okay, sure. We were born Gentile. We don't have the history and the deep personal intimate knowledge that these Hebrews had with the law and with the Jewish traditions. This would have shook them. It's not wrong, but it would have taken them and said, I understand Moses was great, but Jesus is so much greater. And you kind of got to get that through your head. <laughs> Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as your fathers did at the rebellion of Israel and Meribah on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing my forbearance and tolerance and saw my works for 40 years and I found and found I stood their test. Therefore, I was angered with this generation, and I said, they, all, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways, nor become progressively better and more intimately acquainted with them. So I swore an oath in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, the promised land. Now, the waters of Meribah were in Exodus chapter 35. If it's not that one, it's another one. It's somewhere in there. Actually, it's probably 21. It's in Exodus. Anyway, what happened was, in that chapter, they had just gotten out of 
Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had to walk across three days of wilderness. Spoiler alert, even if you look at a Google map of Israel today and the area that they walked across, it's still desert with a lot of nothing in it. And not just a little, a lot of nothing. No rivers, no waterways, no nothing. And being humans, you kind of need water. Feels important. And so when they got to water, when the nation of Israel got to water after three days of wandering, the water wasn't good to drink. And so they complained to Moses for the first of many, many times and said, why didn't you just let us die in Egypt if you were going to kill us out here in the middle of nowhere? God told them he was testing them. He fixed the water. He, by throwing, what was it? Moses threw a branch into it. The water was made clean. And then springs of water came up because God doesn't just supply your need. He will over and abundantly go beyond anything that you could ever ask or think to supply your need because it brings him greater glory that way. Oh, and by the way, those verses were quoting Psalm 95, 7 through 11, if you're keeping track at home. <laughs> but he told them, because of that rebellion, because they failed his test and they tried to test him, he said, you will not enter my place of rest, which then was the promised land. But the promised land was a picture. The Sabbath rest was a picture pointing to our rest in Jesus. And in verse 12, he says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. But continually encourage one another. And I love this. Every day, as long as it is called today. As long as it is called today and there is an opportunity so that none of you will be hardened in settled, into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, its cleverness, delusive glamour, and sophistication. For we believers have become partakers of Christ, sharing in all that the Messiah has for us. If only we hold firm our newborn confidence, which originally led us to him until the end. Now, that could make it sound like you might be able to lose your salvation. You can't. Once you believe, you believe. And we'll explore this more in chapter 6, because there are verses that are wildly misunderstood in chapter 6. That's it. You didn't save yourself. You can't lose yourself. I've always thought, my way of thinking it, the Bible says that once we're saved, God puts us in the palm of his hand. I've always thought it was mighty arrogant of humanity to think that we can undo something that God did. No one can snap, not even you. What is it? It's Romans 8 says, no created thing can separate us from the love of Christ. Last time I checked, we were created things. So not even you can separate you from the love of God once you've decided to accept Jesus as your Savior. <laughs> but I love that. As long as today is today, there's an opportunity. Maybe you, now, maybe your issue isn't salvation, but maybe you've let your heart be hardened. Because this time of year, Christmas time, feels overly taxing and it's and the thought is and i don't mean this to sound bad i love christmas i love what i love the celebration i love the time with family i love getting to give gifts but there's a part of me that goes man i can't wait till new year's because on new year's i get to sit at home in my robe and if i don't get dressed no one knows no one cares i've got nothing to do i've got no one to be on New Year's Day, and there's a lot that goes into Christmas. I have four Christmases that I go to before anything happens here at Heart of God Fellowship. And it used to be seven. No, they know better than that. They don't want to break a camera. Especially not Ruth. She knows. I'm not, pay I'm not paying for a new phone. If that camera breaks, it's on her. <laughs> but it's easier to to let your heart be hardened in Christmas because of the extra obligations and the extra things that are going on. And you think, man, I don't want to do this. Man, I hate this commercialism. Man, I hate the materialism. But you're still spending the time to celebrate Jesus. Amen. You celebrate his birth now, and in about four months, you're going to celebrate his resurrection. Now, you can celebrate his birth and his resurrection any day you care to. Celebrate it every day, celebrate it every day if you so choose. But these are the times where we as a society set aside extra time, extra funds to be compassionate, to be the people that we probably ought to be closer to being all year, to love people the way Jesus did. 
to love ourselves the way Jesus does. So don't let your heart get hardened just because you think you're not up to meeting the need. It's not up to you. It's up to God to meet the needs. And he chooses to work through you. Rejoice that you get to be a vessel that God works through. And while it is said, verse 15, now he's quoting Psalm 95, 7 and 8 again, so you've heard these verses, verses very shortly ago. Today, while there is still an opportunity, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me in the rebellion in the desert at Meribah. For those who, for who were they who heard and yet provoked him with rebellious acts? Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And whom, with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it, not those, was it not with those who sinned, whose dead bodies were scattered in the desert? And to whom did he swear an oath that they would not enter his rest, but to those who disobeyed, those who would not listen to his word? Their actions had immediate consequences. Because of their rebellion at Meribah and other pieces of assorted continued rebellion that happened through the 40 years in the desert, no one who was, if I, I'm trying to get this memory right, no one who was alive at that time who was above the age of 20 was allowed to see the promised land. God made it. Huh? Said for two. Oh, except for two, Caleb and Joshua, because they came back with a good report. Everyone who was not Caleb and Joshua and was over the age of 20 was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Yes, Moses saw it, but Moses didn't enter it because he was disobedient when they were getting water from the rock the second time. Now, that goes into a different thing. The rock was a picture of Jesus, and Moses beat the rock a second time when he was told to talk to it. That's why he wasn't allowed in, because you don't have to crucify Jesus twice. Once is enough. That's why. Huh? That's not why? Why? I'll have to look into that, because that's not what I remember. Okay. To the best of my knowledge... But we know that Moses wasn't allowed to enter into the promised land because he was disobedient. Now, in all of this, if you think God is not exceedingly patient when he sets out to do something, let me give you this. They wandered, the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We are told at the beginning of Deuteronomy that it should have taken them 11 days. Days. No matter how stubborn you might be, God is more. <laughs> so we see, verse 19, that they were not able to enter into his rest, the promised land, because of unbelief and an unwillingness to trust in God. Now what that's quoting actually is Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 35. In the same way, what he's setting up is that the unbelief of the people of Israel after the testing of the waters of Meribah, at the testing of the waters of Meribah, is what stopped them from entering into the promised land. For you and I, unbelief in Jesus stops us from receiving eternal life and entering into eternity with heaven. There's only one sin that sends people to hell. The Bible calls it the sin of unbelief. Choosing, when presented with the options, to not accept Jesus as your Savior. Rejecting the Son. Because what we'll see next week is he talks and gives way more detail than I have. And I lied. We're not going to see that next week. We're going to see it after the new year. And I'll explain why shortly. What we'll see the next time we come back to Hebrews is how the Sabbath rest was a picture pointing to Jesus.
I will be here, but I'm doing a Christmas service next week because it's the Thursday before Christmas. I was trying to get there. You jumped ahead of me. It's okay. I tell people all the time, we are more relaxed on Thursday nights than we are on Sunday morning, and I don't think they believe me. They should really just watch tonight's sermon. <laughs> huh? Well, I'm glad. We are enjoying it. But the next time we come back to Hebrews, we'll see that the Sabbath rest was a picture pointing to Jesus. And there's another time when he uses that phrase, as long as today is today, God has provided us an opportunity to choose belief and to enter into the Sabbath rest that is Jesus. Because the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Man, and if people get technical about it, as people like to do, because they get hung up on silly little things, present them with these simple statements. According to the Bible, in Genesis, man was created on day number six. The Sabbath was made on day number seven. We don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant to serve us. It's our time of rest and peace. Rest for your physical body because you work hard. Peace for your mind and your soul because the world tries to rob you of your peace. Shabbat shalom. Shalom, shalom. But that's where we're going. And as we go from here, maybe there's something that jumped out at you. Maybe it's the, being implored to not let your heart be hardened. Maybe it's knowing that Jesus is our perfect high priest, which again, in later weeks, we will see in much more detail. I'll be honest, I'm loving going through Hebrews. It's one of my favorite books, but I, honestly, any book of the Bible I read turns into my favorite. I'm starting to be like Pastor Bob about that. But there are worse things. And I know I finished early, but quite frankly, it was a short chapter and I don't have much more to say. So what I will say before we pray and close down is simple. One, next week, we're doing a Christmas service because it's the last Thursday before Christmas. Two, the week after that, which would be the 28th, we have no Thursday night service. It's the week between Christmas and New Year. Take a breather. Huh? And the day after Christina's birthday. That's the important part. <laughs> Never mind the Christmas and New Year stuff. It's the day after Christina's birthday, so we're all just going to take the night. I mean, heck, take the day. Tell your bosses that it, because it's her birthday, you get to take the day off. She's, we're trying to make it a national holiday, but it hasn't gotten enough traction quite yet. So next week, Christmas, the week after that, we're going to take a break. And then in January, in the new year, we will get back to the book of Hebrews. I hope no one minds, because I'm not really taking suggestions about it at this point. <laughs> yeah, we'll get back. Well, I'm not Yoko telling you to get back, or Paul telling Yoko to get back where you once belonged. <laughs> That's a fun bit of music history. If you... <sighs> this is my fault. <laughs> oh, Chris. I'm usually wearing my Beatles shirt. I went for Lord of the Rings today. Like I said, we missed you, Chris. <laughs> if y'all would be kind enough to bow your head and close your eyes, we're going to say a prayer, speak a blessing, we'll be on our merry way. God, thank you so much for who you are and how you love us. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory because you're the only one to whom those things are due. Father, we thank you that your word is seed sown into good soil in our hearts and, and that it will take root and bear fruit as we go from here. That we're going to look more like Jesus in everything we say, everything we do, the way that we do it, and with the thoughts that we think. We thank you, God, that you give us the revelation about the word that we need as we need it. Father, we thank you that you have made us the salt and the light that this bland and darkened world so desperately needs. And I praise you, Father, for your goodness and your love and your mercy. I thank you, God, for the boldness you have given us to preach the gospel and to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as led by the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for workers for the harvest. Because as you said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Father, I pray for the nation of Israel, and we bless the nation of Israel because they are still and always your chosen people. And Father, I pray that in this Christmas season, it 
suicides go up, abandonment feelings go up. Father, I pray you know the people who need your touch. And right now, Lord, because the Bible says where two or more gather together, you are there also. We thank you, Father, that you would send people to minister to the homeless, to those in nursing homes, to those in hospitals, the rehabilitation centers and the homebound, to our military, those who are in active service, our military reserve and our military veterans, Father, that they would feel your presence and know your touch, that they would know that you have not abandoned or neglected them, that you love them more than they can understand. And Father, we thank you that you lead us and guide us and direct us by Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We thank you that we know your voice and we will not follow the voice of another. I thank you for the blessing that is the Christmas season. And I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty, holy name. Amen. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you, and I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. That is wonderful to hear. I love you all more than chocolate. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Have a fantastic rest of your week. We will see you next time. God bless you.